Good morning, everyone. So thankful that you're here with us today. I'm Shayla Cook. I'm here on behalf of Cascade Water Alliance. Cascade is a municipal water supplier in King County that provides drinking water for 380,000 residents and 20,000 businesses, schools, and commercial properties. You can learn more about Cascade by visiting cascadewater.org. We are really excited to bring to you today for our summer uh, 2022 series, garden series, uh, Emily Bishton, she's going to be presenting on lawn alternatives, and she's new to our um, webinar, so this is going to be really fun. Emily is an environmental educator who has gardened organically for over 35 years. Since 1997, she has taught sustainable gardening and environmental education programs throughout the Puget Sound region and designed many public and private landscapes. We have several partners today. We have Cascade Water Alliance, who's going to be um, giving away some really nice swag in that we'll draw those names at random at the very end. We have water bottles and water timers and um, all sorts of water catchers, which we won't need probably till October. So you'll love those. We'll draw those at random at the very end. Like I said, this presentation will be recorded and is available for two weeks. I will share the link to that next week when it's ready. Um, please use the Q&A function to ask any questions. We're going to um, take questions at the end of the presentation. And then um, we'll wrap things up. And then if there are still additional questions, Emily has graciously offered to stay on and we will get through as many questions as we can today. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Emily. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, in years past, I've done quite a bit of teaching for Cascade, but um, in the past two years, as things have gone uh, all virtual, um, I this will be my first one. I'm uh, very happy to be here. And uh, this is a great time of year to be thinking about lawn alternatives, because it's usually the time of year where our lawns start really showing us problem areas, especially if we have um, compacted soil or sloped soil. You get to see places where it's sort of like been working on this for a long time and, and the lawn is just not thriving. Or you may have other, um, other reasons for wanting to shrink your lawn, as they say. So we're going to go over um, a lot of different ideas for why um, and start with a poll question that um, will allow you to say why you are thinking about shrinking your lawn. And when, while we go to that poll question and then through the presentation, I am actually gonna turn my video off just to not be a distraction. And, um, and then it'll come back on again during the question period. So, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. Great. And then if there are other reasons why you are wanting to um, ideas for lawn alternatives, please go ahead and put that in the Q&A and um, Emily would love to see that. So she knows a little bit of how to uh, direct her presentation. So here we go with the poll. Okay. So which scenario best describes your reason for wanting ideas for lawn alternatives? Please um, choose the answer that best describes why you would like ideas for lawn alternatives. Can they choose more than one? This one is multiple choice. So uh, okay. yes, I believe they can. Okay, great. Choose all that apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll look over at the Q's, Q and A's to see if there's other reasons. Okay, good. Answers are coming in fast and furious. I think you're going right. to love this, these responses. They're just there's a whole variety of, of different reasons. It's interesting, yeah. And they're coming in fast and furious. So I'm going to give everyone just a couple more seconds so they have an opportunity to answer the the poll questions here. And again, don't hesitate to um, use the Q and A function to to answer uh, if there's other reasons. We'd love to see those too. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now, and then I'm gonna share the results. Here we go. Okay, can you see that, Emily? Yes, okay. excellent. 
and I see that a lot of people are definitely doing multiple choice, which is good. Some of the other responses that came in were people want to encourage bees and butterflies in more wildlife space. Yeah. That's, inter that's an interesting um, idea also. And here's another one, um, provide habitat and pollination areas. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So I'll and go I, ahead. Love, I love seeing the fact that so many people do want to use less resources because lawns are a big user of resources. So um, that's fantastic. All right. Yeah, and there's some other great responses about um, they have a full full sun dry slope. So that sounds like a great reason to not have green yeah. lawn on that. Yeah, cold winter, hot in the summer, definitely attract birds and pollinators. Lots of responses around that in the Q&A. Okay. Great. I'll go ahead and stop sharing now, if that's okay, and then we'll keep going. Okay, all right. Okay, so some examples of what, what you may be experiencing. If you've got uh, shade in your yard, and especially if you have trees that you've planted or previous owners planted, and you have, you know, your lawn is going to decline under those trees, even if you try overseeding with, with a, a shade tolerant mixture, there really isn't a, a kind of lawn grass that will do well in the shade of of bigger trees. And also lawn right up against the trunks of trees is actually um, has a suppression of the tree roots and um, creates a situation where young trees may not thrive either. So, um, so that trees and lawns aren't really meant to go together, but they do in, in most of our urban yards. So, um, Having having beds under your trees areas rather than lawn is always a good idea for both. And then as the as the one person mentioned, a slope, a slope of grass is just so difficult. Um, it might look good for a little bit of the year. And then as soon as summer hits, there is no amount of watering that really keeps it looking lush. And uh, and it's, it's no fun to look at, uh, or, or, you know, really not a practical way to um, relax and, and have recreation on a, on a sloped lawn. And sometimes there's just practical reasons like a little setback next to your uh, house is a very, um, not a place where you're going to really hang out too much and want to have a lawn chair, you know, be, be having the lawn. So, it's a great place to swap it out for beds and paths and parking strips. If you're in the city in an urban area between the sidewalk and the curb is, is sort of a no man's land that is um, just a hassle to maintain and usually gets pretty weedy. And uh, as some folks mentioned quite a few, um, food, space for growing food is pretty darn easy to carve out of a, especially out of a sunny area in the lawn. Um, it's probably easier to do on a flat part of your lawn or a slight slope. This is a photo of a, a former client of mine where we carved out on a slight slope and, uh, and it worked fine as far as safety and get, you know, access for, for picking the food and everything. And then, you know, quite a few people said they just, you know, crave less lawn, whether it's to, to not have as many resources or to have more visual interest. You can have both um, and, and create a, a lawn that is more of a design feature than kind of the main uh, feature of your yard. And, uh, and I love doing that. I'm not, I personally did not have a lawn in my own property in Seattle uh, because I lived on a pretty sleep, steep slope. And uh, so I created terraces and beds, but, um, but I'm not an anti-lawn person. They do have a lot of uh, good purposes, especially if you have kids. And, or you like to play croquet or something where you're really going to get a lot of use out of your lawn. But most of us don't need a really big giant lawn. So it's great. And this is a perfect time to be considering what to do also because it's a great time to start preparing for 
uh, fall planting. And as far as plants go, we're gonna go over some plants here in this presentation, but we're also gonna go over how do you determine what plants, what are the ways that you can use and resources you can use to determine what plants are gonna thrive in this new area that you're creating that um, out of your lawn. So it doesn't matter what kind of reasoning that you have for wanting to reduce your lawn. If you wanna put in ornamental plants or food plants, there are many, many choices out there. And before we get going too much on that, um, I also just want to talk a little bit, just so folks understand a little bit more about why it's hard to grow a lawn in the Northwest. Um, and this may um, be helpful, hopefully, to you, but also maybe to your neighbors who might ask you, well, why are you getting rid of part of your lawn? Um, but Lawn grass is something that thrives in very rich soil with a lot of topsoil, a lot of organic matter in it, and a lot of summer rain. Those are things that don't exist in the Pacific Northwest. We tend to have very, um, very small amount of topsoil, um, sometimes none at all in our properties, and our rain leaches organic matter out of the soil. So it's very easy for the soil in a, underneath the lawn to just get very depleted and not really be um, giving the grass what it needs to grow and to develop deep roots to become drought tolerant during our dry, dry summers. So um, that's why it, you know, it, it takes a lot of water in the, in the summer when, when the rain stop to keep our lawns, um, you know, looking green and thriving. Whereas in the Midwest, all this, all the irrigation water is coming straight from the sky all, all, uh, all year, all summer long during the growing season. So um, I, that's why I like to, when in all the years that I've designed landscapes, I think of a lawn as a design feature, not as the main um, kind of the main player in your, in your yard. So regardless if you have a sun or shade conditions, some of both, um, you can, there are so many different plants to choose from. So a lot has to do with your taste, but also you have to consider the actual components of your garden that are gonna determine the best choices for you. But there are many subs, you know, uh, substitutes for a lawn, uh, regardless of what color flowers you would like, or um, berries such as the Kinnick Kinnick in this picture. Um, and this is Plumbago in the, in the center, and uh, Potentilla on the left. And then on this one, I'll just mention this is Hyconocloa on the far left, or Japanese forest grass. And that picture is from the Bellevue Botanical Garden. And then uh, hosta in the top picture and a perennial geranium in the lower picture. So just some examples, and I did put some on the handout as well, um, but I, I definitely recommend when you're choosing plants, once you, once you take the steps to get to know your garden and know what, plant, what type of plants are gonna thrive, I really advise looking in person at a garden, at a public garden in the, in the, wherever you are, whether you're in the Seattle area, there are lots to choose from, um, but, but anywhere in the US. Um, in, the, in the Seattle area, the Center for Urban Horticulture has a wonderful garden that you can stroll anytime. The Arboretum and the Japanese Garden, which there are photos in this slideshow from, from those places. Um, Kubota Gardens and North Seattle Dunn Garden and Krukeberg. Um, if you're on the peninsula, then Bloedel uh, Garden on Bainbridge Island could be close. These are all, all places where you can see ground covers and lawn alternatives in, in their mature form. It's really harder to just look at a nursery 
uh, array where plants are in four inch or one gallon pots and figure out like how many of these do I need and what's gonna look the best when it's fully grown. But when you tour a public garden, you see plants that have been growing for five or 10 years or more. And that is really gonna help you with making your choices also and you're getting to know what appeals to you the most. Um, plants look very different in their mature form than in a little pot in the nursery. So getting to know your existing soil is extremely important before you start choosing what kind of plants that you want to put in your garden. And that includes um, what you need to do to, to add food to your uh, beds as well, food plants. So when, when choosing the plants and also when watering and when adding organic matter, getting to know your soil is, is really vital. And these two soil samples on this rock were from my Seattle garden. My back garden is on the left, heavy clay, like almost you could throw pots out of it. On my right, on the right is from my front yard, which had been uh, filled, that had been brought in to backfill a, a small rockery. And it was very, very sandy. So don't assume that just one area of your garden, if you say, that, you know, under this tree, I want to, uh, change over to lawn, that that means that all areas under your other trees are the same type of soil. Um, soil can be disturbed a lot during construction, and it has only been about 10 years or so since there have been rules for developers about what they have to do to protect that topsoil that is there. So um, the, uh, the part of the handout that is on the second page, it gives you a really easy way to test your soil and, and for its components. So the soil shake would be the first thing you would do and uh, follow those steps. And that will tell you um, very pretty accurately what percentage of sand you have in your soil, what percentage of clay and what percentage of silt. And the, the real um, issue with sandy soil, which is, most often the case that you have a lot of sand in your soil, that organic matter you will need to add to start with, really with any of these soils, but with sandy soil, you will need to replenish it more often. And you can do that with using good organic mulches on your garden when you're finished planting that will gradually decompose into the soil and replenish that. If you have clay soil, the, the clay really holds onto any organic matter very tightly and won't, it doesn't let it kind of percolate through, but you definitely still need to use an organic mulch to keep the microbes and microorganisms healthy in that soil so that they help kind of unstick that clay because clay can get really, really dried out and hard to keep moist, even, even in the winter um, because it, it becomes a, a almost plasticky. And so by having organic matter in the soil, you are helping it open up and let water in better. So, but it's really important to get, kind of get to know these areas of your garden that you want to change um, because each one could be different. Once you get to know your soil condition, you also, you know, are going to be, and many of you, because of what you listed already, I've been paying attention to like, hey, this is too shady or it's too sunny here. Um, and uh, the, you know, you know the reasons why your lawn isn't thriving. But if you're just thinking about doing this and you don't have any real big problems with your, with your lawn, but you still want to remove it, it's really important to look at your garden, even if you've lived there a long time, really look at it throughout a day when you're going to be home. 
because as like I lived in my garden for 30 years in Seattle and uh, over that time the trees I planted and the trees my neighbors planted got bigger I had more and more shade um, also the more trees the more the water in the soil um, was being soaked up by trees so I didn't have as many wet areas as I started with and it's just gardens are always changing. And so getting to know re really accurately where you have real sunny areas and where you have, where it's turning into part shade and it's gonna eventually be full shade under trees um, is really, really important to know too before you invest in plants that, um, you know, plants that like sun are just not gonna thrive if there's not at least six hours of sun. And that's true for, especially for food gardens. If you're changing part of your lawn over to a food growing bed, it needs to have a minimum of six hours of sun if you wanna grow. And, and that is full, full hot sun in the, during the growing season in the summer, the main growing season. You, in order to grow tomatoes or peppers or squash, pumpkins, things like that, you really need to choose an area that you know for sure has enough sun for that. If you're primarily growing salad greens and things like that and carrots that are a little bit more part sun tolerant, um, you, can, you can get away with maybe only four hours, but um, tomatoes and peppers and, and corn and all of these real uh, sun lovers, they would really like 14 hours, um, but minimum six. So um, you almost can't get too sunny of a spot for uh, growing the, the, the sun lover um, vegetables. So knowing, really knowing for sure what your conditions are makes a huge difference. And, and then also on the handout, I listed um, considering where the runoff is coming either from your property, your driveway, patios, downspouts, or any slopes that you have, um, or if runoff is coming onto your property from your neighbors. Um, because if you have a lot of subsurface water coming down from a slope above you, that is going to affect your garden too. And you may, you know, may already be familiar with all that, but it's really good to be thinking of all these different uh, factors that will affect the plants that you choose. That will help you choose plants and uh, that will thrive and you won't have um, issues where you have to replace plants. So in your handout on the first page, I listed several resources that make it really easy to choose plants once you know your garden's conditions. Um, which is why I stress that so much, because I could do, I could talk for three hours about all the different possibilities of ornamental plants that you could put in your garden um, as a substitute for lawn. And, but that's not what we're doing here. So I want to give you the resources to be able to look these things up in a way that is efficient with your time and energy. So the first one is the King County Native Plant Guide, which I love. If you're into native plants or you'd like to learn more about them, this is a great website. So um, once you uh, get on the, this is the home page of the Native Plant Guide. And then um, if you click on the Native Plant Landscaping Plans link from, from which is on the upper right of that screenshot, you will get then a, a whole bunch of choices of, okay, what, what are your conditions? Dry with part shade. It's very common underneath trees, especially conifers. Um, dry and sunny. You need, all these different choices are what comes up next. And then depending on which one you click on, you will get a huge list of plants that, you, that will thrive in those conditions. So it will give you trees and shrubs and ground covers, and it will tell you, um, you know, the exposure and and that in more detail than from the link, how much moisture and the approximate height uh, that each will 
have and, and also how easy they are to grow. So a great way to start narrowing down the choices of that will thrive in your landscape. And one person mentioned uh, wanting to attract wildlife, um, pro provide food for pollinators and birds. A great way to, um, you know, do a search is to also add that in your search. Uh, when you're on the native plant side, and also um, it will give you on the native plant picks, um, which or the great plant picks, which I'll go to next, will give you that um, information too. Because we we all need pollinators, um, whether for our own food crops or for the food crops in the in our region, uh, we need to encourage and and nurture pollinators. Plus, they're fantastic to look at. Um, all there's so many different native bees and there's you know beautiful butterflies and hummingbirds which also pollinate uh, and so there are many many plant choices that will thrive in your garden that will do that will pr provide that if you have a sunny dry slope you could have the best herb garden in your neighborhood because that's exactly the conditions that Mediterranean herbs like oregano, which is in the lower right picture here, um, rosemary, sage, um, so many different um, herbs that then you can cook with, but you can, but also just attract pollinators like crazy. And, um, and then, you know, many, you, I really recommend planting flowers around your food garden. So if you're going to take some of your lawn and turn it into food beds, make sure that you have some flower beds nearby to attract pollinators. Because many food plants don't really ha have showy flowers and they um, really benefit by having something with showy flowers planted nearby so that while the bees and the butterflies and the hummingbirds are browsing on those, they go, oh, look, there's a big old squash plant here. Uh, or there's a bunch of cucumber flowers on this vine and go to it. Um, so it makes, it makes a big difference in your pollination success to have flowers and flowering plants, uh, whether they're shrubs or, or perennials uh, around your food growing areas. Another thing I love about the Native Plant Guide is it has these how-to articles and with photographs and step-by-step -step instructions too. I'm gonna to be going over how to make the transition physically um, with sheet mulching. And I have photos in this presentation about that, but this is ways to kind of reinforce that information. And uh, for instance, something deer resistant plants, if you have deer issues, that's going to be one of the choices that you will help you narrow down what what's best for your garden. So great, great how to articles on that site. And then, as I mentioned, great plant picks is just a really great local treasure for the entire Pacific Northwest. So whether you're um, as, if you're west of the Cascades from from uh, you know, British Columbia down into Northern California. All these plants are tested to show that they're easy to grow and very successful. And so it's a wonderful resource. I think probably would, would function for um, other areas of the US as well. So this has a different way that you search. So, but it, it ends up with a similar amount of choices. And you can um, look for lists um, in the Great Plant Picks list. You can search on your own and plug in a specific plant that you wanna learn more about. Um, but either way, uh, it, will, it, it has an unbelievably vast selection of plants that you can find out about and that will work in your garden. So, when you click on the great plant picks list, this is what you go, the, this is the page you go to. And then it gives you all these different choices. 
um, if you're looking at you know dappled shade and moist soil, dappled shade that where it needs to be very drought tolerant, just so many different choices. And um, no matter what garden conditions that you have. So this, I clicked on the um, drought tolerant and shade because that, you know, in my years of garden design, that's one of the biggest challenges is when you have conifers or when you have big shade trees that are making it difficult for other plants to thrive, you want to choose plants that can handle that and handle the competition from the tree roots uh, for the water that is in the soil. So as you can see, there's just, uh, this is just the A through E <laughs> of that. And so there's there's like, you know, a hundred or more uh, additional plants on this list um, just for this one condition. And the Cascade uh, Natural Yard Care Program website also has links to all sorts of other garden resources. And um, I strongly urge you to check that out too, if you haven't already checked it out. Uh, the Great Plant Picks has a nursery directory for the Pacific Northwest, also links and resources um, similar to the Native Plant Guide where you can have tutorials for uh, how, to, how to plant, how to, um, how to mulch and water and things like that. So when you make these choices that where you're, you're matching your site conditions, you will have your plants become, you know, have a better root system development, become, you know, healthy growing and thriving and sustainable without a lot of energy on your part so that you have time to enjoy them. And this slide, this is from a client in, in Queen Anne that I worked with for many years. Uh, the, the slope they had was, really untenable for any kind of lawn in this area of their property. So they did terracing similar to what I did in my garden, though I didn't put a patio up there. I just put a flat beds, but they put a small patio, just enough for a couple table, couple chairs and a little table and, uh, and then stairs down to uh, an, a flat area uh, in front of their kitchen door. And so they did a combination of saying, you know, we want a gathering place in this place where we don't want lawn anymore. And we want to also grow lots of ground covers that will thrive in these conditions. And this is from my Seattle garden, <laughs> a reminder to choose plants that are hardy, uh, even though climate change is definitely upon us and we can push the envelope a little bit we found out pretty strongly this past winter that heavy snow and ice can still come and um, you know, uh, decimate plants. And so it's really important, I think, with the investment that it is to, to buying plants that um, you, if you're buying perennial plants, trees, shrubs, or, or perennial flowers, that uh, you wanna have them hardy. Uh, no matter what conditions uh, we have and, and weather swings that we have. Uh, really had a lot to deal with last year with the heat dome and then the harsh winter. And this uh, photo also shows another alternative for dry shade under conifers. So I have a have giant cedar tree in the corner of the property and I needed a garden shed. So that is where I cited it. Instead of trying to grow plants there, I fulfilled a different need that I had, which is to have a shed. And the main thing you want to make sure that you do, if you put any structure under a tree of any kind, and that is don't pour a regular foundation or a slab, put it up on post and pier type of foundation so that you're disturbing a very small amount of the tree's root system in order to put in the support for the structure. Um, tree roots are um, easily disturbed and uh, when they're established and you don't want to um, you know, end up uh, causing health problems for that important feature of your garden. 
and uh, so so definitely go very lightly when it's when you're um, working underneath an established tree. And this is another example. This is from the Japanese garden in Seattle, um, a small seating area. So once again, a very they used large flat rocks as pavers, so they didn't have to really disturb much of the uh, tree roots to put in uh, that little small gathering area. But you could put something in larger as if you're using like little pavers or um, stepping stone type of things, just want to disturb as little as possible of the, the root zone. And, uh, and when you're planting plants that are under a very um, dense root zone uh, canopy of a tree, you don't want to go out and buy, you know, five gallon pots worth of stuff where you have to dig a giant hole to be able to plant stuff. Stick with the you know, one gallon or smaller for your additions so that you are not having to disturb that. But underneath a tree is, you know, even though uh, there hasn't been as much sun uh, this year yet, it's really nice to have a shady place to sit. And uh, I'm, I'm all in favor of using that and surrounding it with plants like this in the Japanese garden. So, now we're gonna go into how to make this change and make it easy. And this is whether you're adding, whatever reason you're adding new, new beds and however much of that you're doing. And this is an example of, of a very small amount of lawn removal. There already was a very, very narrow bed, less than two feet from the fence that all the perennials in this landscape had been planted in. And because um, this client had kids and has kids, they didn't want to lose a lot of lawn, even though you can see where their lawn is not thriving. But just so the boys had something to kick the ball around um, with, they had three boys. So they, they you know, had a lot of game playing going on back there and needed to retain uh, most of their lawn. But either way, whether you're going to carve out a little bit or a lot, I like to use a garden hose to lay out on the lawn in the shapes of the beds that you are um, going to create. And that also gives you this option in, in terms of design of your garden to make the lawn have a shape that's really pleasing to you. In, in most, uh, you know, landscapes that are put in, especially by developers, they tend to do everything in squares. Everything is, is, is a box. Uh, and uh, the lawn is sort of the, it ends up being this leftover shape that's, you know, zigzagging around uh, and not, doesn't really have a, become a feature of its own. I'm big into curves and so I like to create curving shapes along the edge of the lawn and it gives the lawn the sort of the shape of a pond in a way. And because a lawn is a uniform plant basically that is kept short, it, and it moves with the wind too, that it really does have that kind of a visual appeal. And if you give it a more organic shape, it even does that even more. So think about your the shape of your lawn as being like, what shape do I want my lawn, my remaining lawn to be? And then let the, the beds can be those leftover shapes. So because um, plants will round them out and make the beds um, even more curved than you make them. So lay out the, the hose, play with it and you know, see what, what appeals to you. Go in the house, look out from the windows, um, you know, try it on in a way. And then when you're sure of where you want the, the edge of the bed to be, just use some utility marker paint that will spray upside down, spray those lines. And a lot of times I'll take the hose away and, and I wanna look at it 
a few times, you know, before I just go, oh, that one needs to be bigger. We need to swoop that out wider to really make it look good. But, um, but so take your time with that. And then once you're really, this is the front yard of the same property where they did not need to maintain a big lawn. In fact, they were really did not want to have lawn at all, ultimately. But, but to start with, they were just going to sheet mulch uh, uh, some big swooping uh, beds around their existing trees. So you want to dig a trench about four inches wide and four inches deep right where you make that mark of the edge of your beds. And if you have a fence or a sidewalk that's on the other side, you need to dig a trench there too, because the newspaper layer, or in some cases you can use cardboard, you need to be able to tuck that down into that trench between whatever lawn you're leaving and, and, and the bed that you're creating so that no sunlight can get to the grass that you are sheet mulching. If you just lay it flat and don't do the trench, you'll get a, just a, a invasion of grass all along the edge of that bed. And uh, that won't be very much fun. So um, do, do the trench and, you, and if you wet the soil down where you, if your soil is all dried out, it's gonna be hard to dig. If you wet it down right along where you've made that mark, before you uh, dig, it'll be a lot easier to make that little trench. Then you wanna cover that lawn grass with about 10 inches, I mean, sorry, 10 sheets thick of newspaper. Um, you can also buy at, at some nursery supply places, uh, a very thin cardboard material that is sort of replicates that. I know that, newspaper itself is not as plentiful as it used to be. And unless you're subscribing to a, a daily newspaper, you may not have enough to do that. So um, you can use a thin cardboard that comes in rolls. You can, if you're doing a flat area, you can use cardboard and go, you know, try to get some, maybe some appliance size or bicycle, a bicycle store, and they have big, big flat things of cardboard if you have a lot of area to cover. But that only works if you are sheet mulching flat ground. Um, otherwise the, the, the wood chips and the mul other mulch that you use is gonna slide off. So in this case, we were, uh, this is at Magnuson Community Center in Seattle. Um, we, these volunteers were helping with a project that we were sheet mulching this slope of grass. And so you can see where they're laying down the newspapers, they overlap them uh, by a couple inches so that no sunlight cannot sneak through between the newspapers and lay that all out. And in this case, um, we also added jute, but we first put three, about three inches of compost. You can use leaves um, if you want. Um, you can use any kind of organic matter on top of that newspaper. It's holding it down and it's also going to decompose into the soil along with the dying grass. The jute is what helps the, sl the slope not suffer from erosion or that the wood chips that we use for the top mulch not to slide off. Um, so if the steeper the slope you have, the more um, using a untreated jute is definitely, you don't wanna use anything that's been treated to resist decomposition, but the, you can buy these jute rolls at a landscape or, or nursery supply place too. And then the, Wood chip mulch is, is an optional top layer, but I highly recommend it to prevent weeds from getting in and to also provide some slow release uh, organic matter as time goes on. Back to the, the homeowner's uh, property. This is what it looked like when they finished the um, laying on of the newspapers and they used a little bit of cardboard in some of the big areas here that were flat. And then you just sit back and let nature do the work. It's 
best to do it in like early fall, right as our rains start, but you could do it now. It's just that you'd want to, because water, moist soil and moist grass is gonna decompose a lot quicker. But if, so if you did it now, I would say water the grass, even though you're gonna kill it, mow it really short and water it well before you sheet mulch it, that will speed up the decomposition for doing it at, at a drier time of the year. In the, in the fall, the rain is keeping that soil moist. That grass is gonna just rot almost overnight. But, um, but you can do it at this time of year if you're ready to, to get started on it now. So I dug back into this uh, after about oh, two and a half or three weeks. And you can see the grass is pretty dead and is starting to turn into compost under the newspaper. And the newspaper turns into compost and the worms start coming up and bringing that top layer of compost down in there. It, it becomes a feast for worms and other, um, other organisms and microorganisms to just start feeding on all this organic matter that's in the soil and incorporating it. And by the time you um, go back in, in a, in a few months, it is just turned to compost. You can't even tell there was ever a lawn there. It's so much easier than in the old, old days, you know, people rented sod cutters and removed it, all that. Well, the Sheep mulching means you're turning that grass into a resource for your garden and you're saving your back and you're saving resources by, by not actually removing that source of organic matter from your garden. And as I mentioned earlier, it really doesn't matter what kind of soil you have. Compost is the best thing you can do. Improves drainage in clay soils, improves moisture retention in sandy soils and gets those roots going down into the soil and will make your plants so use so much less water as they become mature because their roots development will have taken them down deep into the soil where water stays even in the summer. And when plants have a healthy root system, even though you can't see it, you can see the result in the actual above ground portion of the plant. It'll be re more resistant to pests and diseases and outcompete the weeds. It's, it's such a win-win situation and building healthy soil is not the glamorous part of gardening. This is the glamorous part, the, the, the part that is like, wow, look at this um, show that happens out there and uh, in the plants, but this happens so much more when you have done the work to create that healthy soil. And it takes less water for, for, for uh, keeping these plants healthy in the summer too. So here's some before and after shots. This was November, 2011, when that sheet mulching was done. It was by March of, of uh, 2012, there was no remnant even of the jute because there was so much microbial activity and earthworm activity in that soil. Even in that little place between the parking lot and the uh, sidewalk of a, of a you know, community center that it even decomposed the jute. This is what the slope looked like before on the left, all eroded and just not doing well. And this is what it looked like um, three years after it was planted. And with the, that community center had about 20,000 people coming and going um, every year. And some of them cut through the bed <laughs> and, uh, and it's still everything did well. So this picture on the left is, was on the actual cover or the first slide. And this was a slope that would look good for just a few months out of the year. Two springs after it was sheet mulched and planted, it was now a beautiful feature in their garden. And also they used taller plants in it 
because they wanted to sort of give themselves a little more privacy from the street because they were getting the headlights from oncoming cars into the where their street teed right at their house. So they had another uh, way that the that the lawn alternative worked for them was to um, shield them from that. I went into drip irrigation on the handout, which I highly recommend it. This is a simple do-it-yourself or volunteer installed drip irrigation at that same community center. Um, lines that were um, pressure regulating because we had slopes, uh, we used those in all beds, even the flat areas. And then before you, you wanna put this in before you put your top mulch, which I highly recommend wood chips so that those, those lines are covered to protect them from UV and also it reduces any evaporation from the soil. So this is my last slide um, and it's really important one too. It's definitely last but not least, um, we all live upstream and downstream of each other and everything that's in our gardens and everything that's downstream of our gardens will be so much healthier when we don't use any pesticides or chemical fertilizers. It's very possible to create a garden without any of those, without using those things. And building healthy soil is one really important key to ensuring that your plants are healthy and you don't need to resort to that. Okay. I didn't leave a whole lot of time for <laughs> questions, but like I said, I will stay. So, um, so I'm ready for any and all. Okay. Well, I'll start at the top and we'll work our way down. We'll do questions okay. for about five minutes and then we'll do some door prizes and then we'll let everyone go. And then we'll come back and answer some more questions if there are any. This is a great question that I think will apply to a lot of people. Um, low maintenance plants that are also good for dogs, probably in cats and pets in general. Yes. And yeah, plants for your garden that can tolerate dogs running through or kids running through with balls is real important. So I like ornamental grasses for that because they tend to tend to bounce back. So things like uh, miscanthus and penicetum grasses that get you can get ones that are only a foot tall or two feet tall, um, but they're very beautiful and have beautiful flowers that come out in the, in the summer. Um, also things like lamb's ears are super tough and can handle being run through. Um, and they also produce beautiful flowers that pollinators go for. And, um, and then I would also, if you, you know, I always recommend wood chips for mulch, um, a, a, a layer of wood chips, no matter what, but especially if you have kids or pets or both, is they really protect against compaction. And compaction is one other reason why our lawn areas are so hard to maintain because grass needs such a lot of air to its root system, but all plants benefit by that. And so we all have to walk into our beds to maintain them. But when you have kids and pets, you may have that happening all the time. And wood chips will spread out the weight of that so that your air remains in your soil. It's way harder to get it back in than to keep it in to begin with. Great, thank you. Um, there was another question that came up about uh, what public garden has examples of shade plants? I think you mentioned a few very early on in the presentation. The Bellevue Botanical Garden has some great examples of shade, but I would say that like if you're out by, um, um, by Bainbridge, Bloedel has huge beds of shade plants, but also the Krukeberg Garden in North Seattle, um, Kubota Garden in South Seattle, and um, and the Japanese Garden and, and the Arboretum all have big areas of, of shade, uh, shade, shade tolerant ground covers. Um, in the Arboretum, I would be, I would go around the winter garden and the, um, the areas nearest the winter garden have some big, um, 
big ground cover examples. Perfect. And here's a good question. I think that we all um, will get the benefit of knowing the answer to here in the Pacific Northwest. Are ferns difficult to grow in the shade and do they lose their leaves? And I'm going to add a little bit more to that. Um, I know that there are varietals of ferns because there's hundreds of them. I see them out in my, the woods by my house. Uh, maybe you can suggest a couple that would be, you know, easy to grow in the shade and probably even tolerant for kids and dogs too. Yes. I would say um, sword ferns are the are kind of the go-to because they're tough as nails. They can handle now if they're in deep, deep shade, uh, that it, it's a little more difficult. If they're under deciduous trees where they're going to get some sun in the winter, that they tend to get a little bigger um, and and are maybe you know a little you know, greener, a little more lush and exotic looking. But they will they will grow under big trees as well. I've seen them growing right up against cedars in the arboretum. Um, the um, deer fern is one that will tolerate full shade, but it, I wouldn't say it's real tolerant of being stepped on. Um, but it is, a, it is an evergreen fern, like sword fern, that um, keeps its leaves year round. Uh, there's lots of ferns that are gorgeous that lose their leaves, um, like lady fern and like autumn fern and things, but they tend to be, have more delicate fronds and not as easy to, if you do have uh, traffic in your beds, so to speak. Okay, thank you, excellent. All right, guys, it's 10.59, and I know many of you have to go for um, activities for the day. We have some really good comments and questions that we're going to um, get through here in just Great. a couple of minutes after we close out the presentation. But I want to make sure that um, the people who are on get the opportunity to win a door prize. And then I will um, update you with some, some fun things we have coming up and we'll say goodbye. And then of course, if you'd like to come back and, and stay on and keep listening or revisit the presentation, I will share it next week just as soon as it's ready to everyone who's attending today. So what I do for our drawings is I have a spreadsheet of all everyone who's um, registered for our class today. And I use this handy dandy random number generator on my phone. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that. And um, the first person that won a prize, and I'm gonna show you what you've won because you're gonna love it. Um, Jennifer Mullen, you're gonna win this water timer. And I'm telling you, if you haven't found water timers yet for your garden, it's truly a game changer. You can go camping and on vacation and come back and your garden or your plants or whatever needs water in your landscape will still be alive. And I have even better news. I have this exact same one, just coincidentally, I've been using it for like five years now with my um, drip irrigation and my other irrigation that I use for my gardens and my ornamentals. So if I can figure it out, I'm pretty sure that you can too, because <laughs> I'm not super techie. Thank, thank goodness I have a husband for that. So I'm going to be emailing you for an address. It's going to come direct to you um, from the supplier. So, um, so stay tuned for my email from you. And then the next um, purse, two people are going to win fun swag bags from Cascade Water Alliance. Um, I know some of you have seen these before, um, but you're going to get an adorable reusable garden bag, or you can use it for anything you'd like. You're going to get a reusable water bottle. And after you get this, you have to pinky swear no more plastic reusable water bottles. Those say goodbye to those and just have your yummy tap water out of your faucet. And then um, we're going to get a, uh, a rain gauge, which if you, these are fun for adults, but if you have kids, it's really fun. And uh, you can go out and check to see if that deluge you heard on your roof uh, truly was. And if you, how many inches of rain we got, because when the rains come, you know, they can be really intense. Um, this I love, especially if you have people who love to take long showers. It's a water timer. Um, you know, challenge yourself. See if you can get a shower in and do all the things you need to do in less than five minutes. And the good news is, is you're going to save oodles of water and energy. My um, hot water heater is my biggest energy suck in my house. And so when I turn it off and I'm on vacation, I see my bill changes dramatically. So a little bit less hot water goes a long way on your power bill. And then these are really fun. They'll kind of bring out your inner scientist. They're um, toilet dye leak detection strips. And you put these in your water bowl and then you um, let it sit for 20 minutes. And if the blue dye makes its way from your tank to the bowl, 
your toilet is leaking. So you're wasting perfectly good drinkable water right down the toilet. So anyways, these are really fun. I'm going to be sending these to two people, swag bags. Again, they'll come directly from the supplier. So I'll be emailing you for your addresses. And I got to put in my random number generator here. And I'm going to be sending those to uh, number 15, which is uh, Linda Bentley. Linda, I'm going to be sending you a Cascade Water Alliance swag bag. And one more swag bag is going to go to uh, Lois Watson. Okay, so we'll get those off to you. I just want to um, thank you, Emily, for this wonderful presentation and for your time today. Just some tremendously helpful information. I, I think thank all you. of us, as the next, especially next week when our lawns start to turn golden, we'll really be realizing spaces that maybe we don't need lawns at all. So this is really, um, the timing is perfect, I feel like. And then just so the rest of you know, we are going to be putting together some more webinars for August. I'm going to be putting together some, um, a whole series again for fall, which is going to be outstanding. And I will be in touch with those, uh, with that information via the MailChimp. So hopefully you're all getting those and uh, will join me for some more of these fun webinars and for a full um, series of webinars in the fall. Okay. And so thank you everyone for attending. I'm super thrilled that you were here and um, we'll go ahead and keep going with the questions for those of you who'd like to stick around and stay on for a few more um, insightful uh answers from Emily. Okay, so Lois Watson wanted to share with us that some other good examples of um, gardens are the WSU Master Demo Gardens. Um, go Cougars. I have a Cougar yeah. niece, a nephew who's a Cougar, so I, I, um, I'll i go to see a WSU yeah. Master Garden. And that's over in Bellevue also. Yep. Yeah. And there's a, uh, she says there's a pea patch in Bellevue and a, a WSU Demo Garden in Mount Vernon that are two good examples. Okay. So here's another great question. Um, can you suggest some good ground cover for pathways that you can walk on that don't need too much water? You know, that's a that's a really good question because this idea of steppables has, you know, uh, been coming, you know, more into the forefront. And what I have found is that um, there are plants you can walk on, but it's like if you're walking on them and you're rolling wheelbarrows on them and everything else, it's really hard to, for them to put up with that, um, even if they're considered steppable. I think most of the steppables, like um, I, I, my favorite is woolly time. If you have a, um, a sunny area where you got where you want to have a steppable plant. Um, that one's my favorite because it doesn't bloom. So you don't get bees right where you're walking. Um, as much as I like bees, I don't want to step on one. And so um, the, but I really recommend using stepping stones so that you can, you're knowing where you're placing your feet and you're walking in the same place every time and surrounding it with a steppable plant. So the steppables they sell in the in the in the nurseries are I, I mean they all pretty much work but, but I would definitely choose uh, a um, an evergreen. So if and if and it, if you are going to use stepping stones, you can increase beyond what the nursery is calling a steppable to things like black mondo grass or green mondo grass, which they use a lot in the Japanese garden in, in Seattle and also at the Kubota garden. Uh, the, um, because they stay, you know, six inches tall, but they bloom little flowers that are just gorgeous and they're just a delicate thing. But they, you know, if you accidentally step on them, uh, they're no, it's no big deal. But it's because of compaction, like I mentioned earlier, even plants that are considered steppable, it's like you step on them enough, you're pushed all this air out of their soil and they start to decline. And so um, that's why I like to use stepping stones. They don't have to be real big ones, but just giving you a place to put your feet if it's a frequently traveled path. And are azaleas a shade plant or can you grow azaleas in the shade? They can grow in part shade, but they will also do well in, in full sun. They do not like to be in deep shade. They're, um, they're a member of the same family as the rhododendrons. And there are some rhododendrons. The, the kind of general rule is, rule is the bigger the leaf, 
the more shade it can tolerate. Azaleas have all have very small leaves. And so that is a is a clue also that they like they like more sun. And are the plants on the websites that you mentioned all non-invasive species? Yes, they are. Great. Hundred percent. And are all the plants on the list for shade and sun perennials? Sounds like the it sounds like there was many different um yeah I broken out by by yeah, they are. They all list, and I can't say 100%, but I'm pretty sure that because the main goal is perennials, uh, plantings, that uh, that they are all perennial. And if, if not, it will say annual on it. But I really, I mean, I've looked at those sites a lot, and I've never really noticed them having annuals on, it, on either of those. I'm surprised in this next question, I'm surprised it took so long to come up, but this person has English ivy on their trees, which is yeah. common to see in a lot of places. Yeah. And um, she's wondering, uh, she's been trying to get rid of it for years and wondering if sheet mulching right on top of it would help or if she needs to just rip it all out. Ripping it out is a better uh, solution and even if you're going to sheet mulch, now there's been some experiments done with English ivy and with blackberries too, um, because they're so difficult to get the entire root system out. Um, the, there's a, the, um, well, let's see, it's the Washington uh, Native Plant Society, WNPS.org. I believe their website has a section in it called Ivy Out that has some really great how to do it in an easy and safe way to try to remove the eye as much of the ivy as you can. And when it comes to trees, if you cut the ivy at the base of the tree, don't without you know harming the trunk of the tree or the bark itself, and then cut about a foot or two up into the the up on the trunk. So you're removing a chunk of the, of the growing, um, whatever the, the piping of that ivy that's going up into the tree. That um, ivy that's up in the tree will die and will eventually fall out or get blown out by the wind. So you don't have to be working in the tree itself, but on the ground, getting up as much as you can and trying to make it so that when you're sheet mulching, one of the goals is you want coverage. You, you don't want a bunch of air in here. And so if you had a lot of foliage and things, it'd be hard to get that sheet mulching to lay down enough to really get those microorganisms to um, attack and, and feed on the decomposing ivy. So it would, it would be a lot less successful if you didn't try to, my friend Chris says, get it down to the schnitz. And that, you know, that you want to get as low. That's why I mentioned mowing the grass short. It's like you're going to get that good sort of adhesion between the sheet mulching and what you're trying to kill. Perfect. And can you use sheet mulching around large trees without impacting the tree's aeration? That's a really, really good, good question. I'm glad it was brought up. Um, the... Uh, the, the great thing about sheet mulching is you're not adding a lot, you're not adding soil to the top of those tree roots. You're adding compost, which has a lot of air in it. And then, and then the, um, the newspaper, which is gonna decompose and the wood chips, which will slowly decompose, but they will retain air in there as well. So you want to, under a tree, you're gonna to stick to that, you know, a couple inches of compost on top of the newspaper, and then maybe a couple inches of wood chips on top of that. And, um, and that will not harm the air getting to those tree roots, because that is really important. Air, air is vital to, to trees. And, and people do make mistakes sometimes when they add soil and try to build a bed with soil and, and smother the air out of, out of those tree roots. So, but that's another reason why I mentioned using smaller, when you do buy your nursery plants, use smaller ones, the, the, especially the closer you're getting to that trunk you really don't want to disturb the, the buttress roots at all. 
And on the picture that you um, were showing about halfway through your presentation, you have the, you had the hose, a black hose kind of winding through yeah. the landscape. Um, was that, the, the, uh, Constance wants to know if that was a, I think she's asking if it was a drip irrigation, if, the, if the, that particular hose had holes in it, or if it was just the black plastic um, hose that you would, you know, do uh, a tail into for a, a plant to irrigation. So know? the slide was the one where um, I was marking the beds, is that? I, I think so, I think okay. so. That was just a regular garden hose. Okay. So it was just serving as a visual sort of design uh, assistant so that you could have a marker that showed the edge of the beds and then that was removed. It was not used as part of any of the finished uh, bed. Okay, and Constance, if I didn't ask, ask that question correctly, um, ask, ask again, or just let me know that I didn't, I, no, missed, yeah. I missed the mark on that. The, the drip ir irrigation photo that I showed that had the black, it did have black hose winding all through the ferns. Okay. That was a mainline hose with emitters built into it. Pressure compensating emitters were built into that every, I think, two or three feet, which you can buy. You can buy that mainline with the emitters at one foot apart, two feet apart, three feet apart. And that way you don't have to attach a whole bunch of other emitters to the to the main line, it's built in and they're, they're pressure compensating so you can use them on a slope and they also don't clog, uh, they, they really are clog resistant too. Excellent, and here's another one that um, comes up often. It's about buttercup, how to get rid of buttercup that um, has taken over your yard. And buttercups will, will if you, we eat them down to the schnitz uh, and then uh, sheet mulch them. They, they usually die. But one thing that's really good to know, I mean, weeds tell you a story um, and that's a whole nother topic, but um, buttercups are an indicator of heavy soil and compacted soil. So you may have a higher clay component than you're aware of. And you probably don't have any air in, your, in the soil where it's growing because they don't mind, they colonize those areas. So that gives you a clue too on the fact that the, um, you know, fluffing up that soil is gonna help too. The buttercups don't like to be in really good, rich aerated soil. Here's another one that comes up every um, webinar about moles and voles. How do we get rid of it or deal with the moles and the voles in the Pacific Northwest? Because they're yeah. prolific right now. They are. It's, it's, I mean, their young are all growing in those burrows in their, in their nesting chambers and stuff. So um, they're trying to teach them how to live and, and they haven't, it, it's getting to the time where the parents are going to tell the young to scram. So it will get better. But um, right now the parents are tr trying to feed them. So it's, 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 they're tunneling and tunneling and tunneling to try to get enough grubs. The good thing about moles, which are very different than voles, moles are an indicator that you have earthworms and other, you know, other sources of food in your soil that are good for your soil. So it is a, it has a positive side, even though it's aggravating. Um, and, and one, one great thing about um, transforming part of your lawn to uh, beds is that uh, mole holes in a lawn are a way bigger hassle than they are in a garden bed. And moles do not eat the roots of garden plants. They are just harvesting what falls into their tunnel um, when, when they are feeding. So, um, I, you know. <laughs> Voles now, voles do eat roots. That's a bigger problem. And I, um, I personally suffer from gophers, which eat roots, uh, and and uh, it's a, it's really aggravating. Uh, I've had some pretty good luck with those sonic beepers, though they kind of drive me crazy. But you put the beeper in there, and it it makes them want to go elsewhere to your neighbor. So <laughs> don't tell your neighbor about it or they'll chase theirs into your garden. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish I could be more helpful about that, but I'm, I'm not an expert. And this is a really good question that I haven't seen before. Um, 
So we know there's classifications of sun and part sun, you know, you can pretty easily define it, but this one is about shade. So this one is asking about how do we know what kind of shade do we have? Do we have open shade? Do we have deep shade? Is there a reference guide on, um, or some rules of thumb on, on how to know what kind yeah, of shade how, you have? how shady is it? Yeah. And that's, you know, for one thing, observing your garden is, is the, is the uh, biggest key, but when you think, uh, when you go out to your garden at this time of year, the plant leaves have pretty much grown as big, as much, you know, the, the deeper, um, the deeper the shade is, well, I should say the, the, the more complete the leaf coverage is, the deeper the shade is. So plant, there are some trees that have more of an open canopy and you can see skylights coming down and then little spots of sunshine coming down on the bed right under there. And they call that dappled shade or, or a, um, a part shade or mostly shade condition. If you go and look at your beds and there is, it is just nothing's coming through the tree, then you know you have full shade. If you have a really big tree that you're like, boy, I wish, you know, maybe I wish it wasn't quite so dense. If you have a, an arborist or capable person that could come and make a few skylights by taking out a few smaller branches, then you could achieve a dappled shade if you need, if you really want it. But, um, but there are plants that, there are plenty of plants that like full shade that can handle that. And in the Northwest, when it's a deciduous plant, even though it, it's dark and stormy a lot, there's enough sun coming through there that things like sword ferns will be like, okay, hey, I could handle the deep shade all summer, but hey, in the winter, I'm gonna get that diffuse sunlight. So, um, so there is there if you have deciduous trees, you, there's a little more options than if you have full shade under conifers. Excellent, thank you. And um, just we'll just do a few more questions. I know we're 20 minutes past 11 now, so we'll do maybe just a couple more and then we'll wrap up. Um, can ground cover be planted from seed? This person has a lot of space they want to um, use for ground cover, and buying uh, starter plants would be really expensive. Yeah. Uh... I don't have a lot of experience with that. It's, if you, I would say, gosh, I don't know what to say about that, but I will give you one tip about buying a, for a large area. The, if, um, if you're in Western Washington, I know for sure that Snohomish County, Pierce County and King County and Kitsap County all have an annual native plant sale that's put on by their um, uh, their conservation district. And they sell little bare root starts of ground covers, as well as they sell ground, uh, bare root trees and shrubs. And they're very inexpensive compared to what you buy when you buy containerized plants in a nursery. So it's, it's a way you could probably get, uh, you know, five or 10 plants from them at the price of one plant from a nursery because they're, um, they're bare root. But that means you have to get them in the ground right away. Most of those uh, plant sales happen in the late winter and early spring. And then you just, you really gotta be ready with your bed already so you can get those bare root plants in. But that is a way to get a lot of coverage for not a lot of money. Excellent, and will sheet mulch uh, work for plants with rhizomes. She's got geraniums that will take over. A biocovo geranium. I know I didn't say that correctly. I think uh, I think I know what what is it the uh, herb Robert. I think is maybe what what they're talking about. Um, not sure what the botanical name is for that, but uh, I would say yes, it will work. Uh, the the um, the smaller the rhizome, the quicker it's going to decompose under those conditions. But you're denying all light to those plants, and you're also keeping them in a moist condition, which is just the perfect atmosphere for decomposition. And but once again, I would take them down, weed eat them down, so that you're not you don't have their their leaf canopy holding up the 
um, and providing air or the opportunity for sunlight to get under the sheet mulch. And we'll, we'll conclude with this last question. It's um, I think something that many of us see in even small or large spaces, but this particular yard gets areas of standing water in the winter. Wanting some options to deal with that, considering swells or maybe a dry pond or a riverbed in the summer, any suggestions for plants that will do well in the flooded areas yes. floods during the winter? And I lived in a bog in Seattle, so I know I know that uh, that uh, dilemma. Um, one of my very favorites is the red twig dogwood, and it comes in a ground cover version that is called Kelsei, that um, gets only about two feet tall and then spreads and uh, is got these beautiful wine red stems in the winter, just gorgeous plant. Um, but the uh, the best resource I can tell you is WSU has a really good rain garden site and a list of plants that can live with their roots submerged in water for part or all of the year. And uh, I wish I had that website at right on hand, but um, it, if you look up um, rain WSU rain gardens if you google search that I bet you'll come up with that because they put out an entire guide on if you were wanting to create a rain garden in your yard and direct your downspouts into that and have plants survive in all different parts of the rain garden so when you're looking at that guide look for what they're recommending planting down in the bottom and the lowest part of a rain garden, because that's basically you have a natural rain garden happening in your yard. Excellent. Which, you know, found challenging, but it, I ended up loving, I put in two, two um, rain gardens in my yard that did not have to have supplemental water because I had so much subsurface water and I loved it. It was a wonderful feature to have. Um, when it when they when I finally figured out what to do with with that those low lying areas so um, yeah I think you'll have fun with it well excellent thank you Emily so much this was really fun a fun way to great. spend a Saturday a very it. Saturday great. summer morning with you yeah great information great. Um, really fun and I just want to remind everyone that's still on once I close out there will be a, a very short it'll take you two or three minute survey I learn and adapt every um, webinar and every webinar session from those um, comments and from that feedback. So if you would take the Great. time to do that, I would greatly appreciate it. And other than that, have a wonderful rest of your summer. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And until we see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.